Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Debbie Lee, the Director of Melbourne Jewish Book Week, and I'd like to start this evening by respectfully acknowledging the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land on which Melbourne Jewish Book Week is based, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Tonight we again partner with the Jewish Quarterly to bring to you an interview with one of their international contributors in the latest issue, Javier Sine. Javier is an award-winning author, writer and journalist, the recipient of the Gabriel Garcia Marquez Award and the author of several books, including The Murders of Moisesville, The Rise and Fall of the Jerusalem of South America. He is the co-author of a, of a 150 year anthology of Argentine crime news and has also uncovered a book on the history of Jewish Argentine journalism originally published in Yiddish almost 100 years ago. He lives in Buenos Aires. Interviewing Javier is our very own Alyssa Goldstein, who in addition to being a Melbourne Jewish Book Week programming committee member, is also a writer and editor and currently a digital producer with The Age in Melbourne. Alyssa holds an MFA in creative writing with Brooklyn College and previously worked at Tablet in New York, where she co-produced the podcast Unorthodox. Tonight's discussion centres on the utterly intriguing, shocking and devastating unsolved crime, the 1994 bombing of Armia, the Jewish cultural centre in Buenos Aires, in which 85 lives were lost. I will now hand over to Alyssa and Javier. Thank you, Debbie, for that wonderful introduction. And hello, Javier, and um, welcome Hi. to Australia, so to speak. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to begin uh, by summarising the event of the bombing and also the gist of your article because I find that that is helpful at the beginning of an interview. I know some people watching this interview will have read your article, some will be in the middle of it, some will not have read it but will be about to read it and will have varying degrees of knowledge about the event that you're writing about. So I think that would be helpful for a little introduction. So I've summarised something here. Um, okay. So for the event, to explain to people what the event itself was. At 9.53 a.m. on the 18th of July 1994, a terror attack was carried out at the Army building in Buenos Aires, killing 85 people and injuring hundreds. The building and the AMIA stands for the Argentine Israelite Mutual Association, translated into English, was and still is, albeit rebuilt, the Jewish Community Center for the largest Jewish community in Latin America, which is one of the largest in the world outside Israel. The attack was carried out by a suicide bomber with links to Hezbollah and the Iranian government who drove a van packed with explosives into the building. The victims were both Jewish and not Jewish. The event had and continues to have a catastrophic impact on the Jewish community and on Argentinian politics more broadly. But beyond these foundational facts, there is a lot of ambiguity around the bombing. Who planned it exactly? Who are the people who executed it? Who should be held accountable? Who is guilty? The investigation into the bombing has been protracted, confusing and labyrinthine, characterised by layers of corruption, dead ends, lies, dubious deals, political interference, and in 2015, the mysterious death and possible assassination of prosecutor and lead investigator Alberto Nisman. Almost 29 years after the attack, there has been no justice for the victims. So that is the summary of the event. And this brings me to Javier's article, uh, which is in um, the most recent edition of the Jewish Quarterly, which is simply titled The Armia Bombing. But there is nothing simple about the bombing. And there is nothing simple about this article, uh, which is brilliant, uh, riveting and, comp and compelling. It is a long form exploration of the legal, political and cultural aftermath of the investigation. It is a clever and literary piece of journalism that uh, does something very clever in the writing and that it evokes in the reader the confusion of everything surrounding the bombing, 
but it also provides moments of clarity and there is direction. It's 66 pages long, divided into 20 sections that are small chapters. And I would say that it is a microcosm of the drama and dysfunction of the investigation. Uh, the best way I can describe the experience as a reader is with a little metaphor that is partly inspired by the last chapter of the article, uh, where Javier tours the AMIA file, the file of the investigation, which is a physical space. Um, and we'll get to that later, but I wanted to summarise how it felt to me. Uh, reading this article is like taking a tour of an immense estate or palace, perhaps one built by an emperor or a dictator, and Javier is a knowledgeable and articulate guide, opening 20 doors, explaining the contents and purpose of each room. But, Javier warns us, each room may or may not contain a secret door leading to a hidden tunnel. And the estate is so unwieldy and so sprawling that it is unknowable. We can get a feel for it through the tour, through opening each of these 20 doors, reading these 20 chapters, but we can never know it fully or see the layout in its entirety, and perhaps no one can. As I was reading, I was reminded of the work of the great Argentinian writer, Jorge Luis Borges, forgive my pronunciation, Javier, if it's terrible. Beautiful. Who, who is an amazing writer um, and who is also preoccupied by puzzles, labyrinths, metafiction and ambiguity. I also thought of the hard-boiled noir detective novels of Raymond Chandler. And there is even something tragicomic about the legal proceedings too, with the greatest respect for Charles Dickens, the case of Jarndyce and Jarndyce in Bleak House does not even come close to this. So I want to begin our conversation, Javier, by congratulating you on distilling such a huge and unknowable story into something that is compelling and informative and readable. That also has at its heart compassion for the victims and their families uh, who are still waiting for justice. Mm -hmm. So with all that, my first question for you is, can you tell me your first memory of the Amy bombing? Yeah, well, thank you so much for that introduction. You really have said it all. I, I can tell you my memory and then I don't know what else will I tell you. Oh, I've got <laughs> lots of questions. But, and you know, I am a big fan a big reader and a big fan of Borges and Chandler mm. so you're on the key <laughs> so my first memory of the AMIA bombing was the very exact noise of the bombing because I at that time in 1994 I lived in an apartment that was like oh. seven blocks away from AMIA and it was July and that's winter here in Argentina. So we were in the kids in winter holidays. So I was alone at home. Uh, I had wake up a few minutes ago. Uh, in, at that time there was no internet. So there was the TV and I turned on the TV just to, to watch, um, I don't know, whatever it was in the morning, like news or something like that. Uh, and everything, as, as, as it says in the article, everything went boom. Mm -hmm. So it was a big, a big noise and some, some big vibration in the walls. Uh, of course I didn't knew, I didn't know it was a bomb or I didn't know it was an attack. Uh, I didn't know anything, but as time passed by that day, of course, there was a lot of news uh, in the TV. And I can remember talking on the phone with my parents who were working and We were we were all the family safe, but the the phone calls were quite dramatic, and then there was another uh, round of calls, which were about deciding if we 
going to give some blood to donate blood uh, in the hospitals because there was a very big call to donate blood and finally mm -hmm. we didn't do it so that was till, till the end of the day mm -hmm. and i i i am now remembering also that uh, the attack was on Monday, and on Thursday there was a big manifest, a, a big demonstration, very big, like 150,000 people, and I was there with my father. It was a demonstration under the rain, so there were there were a lot of umbrellas, uh, and I can remember we have our umbrella, and it was a silent demonstration, so it was it had a very big impact on mm -hmm. me as a uh, as an early teenager of 13 years old mm. yeah wow. yeah that, that was that week for me mm. um you could you could you tell me a little bit about your connection to the Jewish community in Argentina. Um, as Debbie mentioned in her introduction, you've written uh, two books, at least, that I, that I know of. Yeah, about the community. True, true. Um, yeah. And, and maybe a little bit about how your family ended up in Buenos Aires. Yeah. So uh, I, I am all, all Jewish. I, my four uh, grandparents are Jewish, uh, are Jew. Uh, the Sinai, which is my my father's line, they came to Argentina in 1894 with Baron de Hirsch mm -hmm. and the Jewish Colonization Association. And that was a very big, um, a very big, like plan. a program to bring, bring people out. Yeah, like a very mm -hmm. plan dreamed by this Baron de Hirsch, who was a philanthropist uh, from Germany, and he was contemporary to Baron de Rothschild. Mm -hmm. So Rothschild wanted to move the Jewish people from Russia to Israel. So the state of Israel didn't exist at that time, but there was, of course, the beginning of the Zionist um, plan or the Zionist dream. Um, Baron de Hirsch said something like, the Ottoman Empire, which was ruling over Jerusalem, was in tension with the Tsarist Empire. So if the Tsarist Empire invades Jerusalem one day. There is no sense in moving the people from Russia to another place which can be under the ruling of Russia. So this was the idea of the, the geo, geopolitical idea of Baron de Hirsch. So he said, let's move the people to America. Hmm. Uh, at that time, the United States were not receiving people and Argentina need people. So that was like the match between Baron de Hirsch in Europe, between the Jewish people in Russia and between the Argentine government um, who wanted people to modernize the economic, um, the economy and to make, you know, a more productive economy in the, in the fields. So that's how the Sinai, the Sinai family came here um, to, uh, to an, a colony, to an agricultural settlement. Then my other uh, ancestors came like from Poland in the 1920s. That, that was a urban immigration. The first one was a rural immigration. And then they all ended up here in the city of Buenos Aires, like to find some work, uh, to find some university studies. Mm. So that that was the history of my family. My there's, a great, great, there's a great line. I think I'm not sure if I'm 
uh, remembering, oh yes, it's a great line in your article. We planted wheat and harvested doctors. Yeah. Which mothers in Argentina used to say of their children. Yes, because you know, the Argentinian Jewish community is maybe the only one or one of, of very few Jewish communities that started in the fields, not mm. in the city. And then the people came to the cities mm. to find studies and work, jobs. Mm. Um, so my great, great grandfather was a rabbi. And, and from that man to me, we have been losing our religion or our religious, not the religion, but the religiosity or the the practice of the religion. Yeah. So I am, I would say, 100% uh, secular, but there is still in my family a lot of Jewish cultural heritage and Jewish cultural mood, I would say, mm. like yeah. behavior. Mm. Interesting. So, yeah, yeah it's, that, it's interesting that, context for what you've written about here. Sorry? It's an interesting context for uh, your work and this story as well. Yeah. So, yeah, so you have mentioned my two books. These mm. books are, uh, they, they, the two books have started when I have looked back to my great grandfather, the son of the rabbi who was a journalist and in fact, he was the first, the man who wrote the first Yiddish newspaper in Argentina and in Latin America in 1998. So... Uh, the journalism well, is in your blood. <laughs> yeah, I was going to tell you about the books, but that, that's another, mm. another topic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, know, have... I, I know, I know what I was going to tell you, I, I remember. So when I, I didn't know anything about that man until I started an investigation uh, in 2009. Uh, so I, I was able to recover a lot of my family heritage with this. And then I was, um, I wanted to be a member of AMIA. You know, there are thousands of members who pay month by month. Member is not the exact word, but mm. like the people who, who are- Like supporting but, the organization? Yeah, that, that's it. So my investigations led me to be a, a supporter of AMIA. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in, in the background of this story, I am mm. also a supporter of AMIA. Mm. Um, well, this is a good segue into my next question. Um, you quote in the article Miguel Bronfman, who is the AMIA's lead lawyer, and he describes the investigation into the bombing as, this is his words, a black hole that swallows everything and destroys as it goes. Uh, and I was wondering if you could read from the middle of page 64, where chapter 20 yeah. begins, uh, because I think it will give the reader a sense of this. Maybe read from the beginning of pay of section 20 to the, the middle of page 65. Um, okay. Give some of the your writing in your own voice. Okay. You will need to excuse my pronunciation. And please... Do stop me when I reach the, the sure. part that that's it. Yeah. So I start. The AMIA case file reached colossal proportions and was digitized. 720 sections, 146,000 sheets or pages, 422 binders, 77, uh, no, 700. 75 phone lines tapped, 134 people suspected of having some form of involvement in the attack, 
of whom 42 remain under investigation. 70 people had inquiries dismissed by prosecutors and eight were officially acquit acquitted. Probably is the largest file in Argentina. I asked the prosecutor if I can see that file. I think about everything it contains and everything it conceals, about its testimonies and its rulings, about the dust, the money, and the blood that ran through, the, through its pages. I want to see that inconceivable, eternal monst monstrosity. Is it possible? Is it, is it possible? Yes, of course. The file can be found in this public prosecu prosecutor's office. Basso, who is the prosecutor, invites me to see it and take a tour of the office, two things that are in fact the same because the file occupies the entire space, expanding into every corner and every room. The file is the office and the office is the file. We make our way through a few rooms of metal shelves on which rest the, archi the archives and objects from the summary proceedings. In one room on the wall, there is a chart showing Iranian terrorists. In another room, a map of Floresta, the neighborhood where many of the suspects live, each of their houses marked. In a little room, I see a safe. In a narrow office, there are folders from the CIDE that are being de declassified. One page has been left on the, de on the desk. It is written in Farsi or Arabic. I have no way of knowing if it is a diamond or a lamp of coal. We okay. advanced. I'll get you to just okay. stop there. Yeah, that's great. I think it gives it a sense of how big this investigation is. Um, and there's a beautiful sentence at the end. Uh, it's not a spoiler because there's no spoilers in this very complex yeah. story but you say that the office that contains all these files is in fact a snake biting its own tail a snake made of paper born to die again and again in mysterious cycles uh which i think is sort of an image you know of an ouroboros you know the the, the snake yeah. sort of eats itself um given that this is such a which brings me to my next question how do you as a journalist begin to write about something that is as big and as daunting as this? Where do you start? Well, that's, that was really difficult. Jonathan Perlman, the editor of Jewish Quarterly, sent me an email and he, and he wrote, well, after the presentation, he told me, would you like to write an article about the history of the attack on AMIA? And I thought, well, this one is crazy. That <laughs> cannot be written. That's impossible. Uh, but he finally convinced me. So it, it was, I don't know if it was possible, but the, the train was made. So first of all, I have done like a very big uh, searching in Google. And the thing that was um, most uh, most that that I have used most were timelines. Timelines published on media, on the news, when there was like the fifteenth anniversary, the twentieth anniversary, and they, you know, the the newspapers published used to publish timelines. I, so I that, work at a newspaper and work on timelines like that for <laughs> investigative pieces. So I know exactly what you're talking about each day and month and years to help the readers follow the full history. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So imagine a timeline is like basic in this really complicated his, uh, story. So that helped me too because I was, I had never... Uh, written about this case so I had been following the case as a reader as a citizen and I was not into the detail and I was quite lost 
because there were three trials, uh, one judge and two prosecutors removed. There were um, a lot of uh, people coming into the case, going out the case. So along the years, I mean. So this, I started with, with these timelines and then I, I wrote the list of, of names of people that I needed to interview. And then it was like finding the phone and calling the people mm -hmm. and ask for an interview. And quite surprisingly for me, the very majority of the people accept talking with me. Mm -hmm. I think because that's because there was no justice. So everyone is not guilty. So everyone is like thinking I am right. No one can tell me that I am wrong. Mm. Uh, especially Carlos de Sheldin, mm. who is the main suspect. He was three times pled not guilty. So he told me, yes, come, I will tell you everything. Mm, mm. Yeah. It also so seems the... like because there's almost a conspiracy around it, everyone has their theory, their favorite way of interpreting it, you know, like their pet theory about oh this is what I think happened or this person yeah. you have to look down this alleyway or no that story is rubbish there's a lot of um people yeah, and, the, yeah. And, and the suspect of theory a for example mm. told me no it was all theory b mm. so then I was I went talking with the suspect of theory b <laughs> and maybe this suspect uh, told me I am not guilty. It's all uh, theory A. Mm. So everyone wanted to talk, wanted to tell tell me their own truth. And there is something that one journalist told me that was quite uh, exact or quite like a compass. And he he told me, if anyone tells you that he knows or she knows the truth about this case, he or she is lying to you because mm. no one knows. Mm. You'll never know. And that's almost like my conclusion. It, yes, yes. Well, also in a, in a country with um, a history of um, corruption and dictatorship and a lack of transparency, it's very difficult uh, even in a democracy that is functioning well and mostly not, yeah. correct, it's very hard to understand something like this. And in a yes. country where there is a deep history of dysfunction and corruption, to work through, to get the facts and then to work through all of the layers of that history is like an extra barrier to getting to the truth, you know. Yeah, because as one of the judges told me there was corruption, um, there was like little episodes of corruption, one after another one when they were investigating. So for example, they ordered the, the I mean the judge, because here there was a, an investigating judge because of the system I had at the, from that time. So for example, the judge told the police uh, go and find the motor of the um, of the vehicle who who was that was carrying the bomb. So maybe it is probable that the very same police is involved in the buying and selling of that vehicle. Yeah. So there was. When they were going to 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 after the order of the judge, they like they destroy the what the they find. Yeah, the evidence. Yeah. Yes, and you have so, the, the they're investigating themselves, which is an inherent yeah, conflict. That, that's, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. one episode of corruption like this, another 
Yeah. And then another, and then another. Yeah. And little, so little lies within lies because of the little yeah. power struggles within different groups of the police and the prosecutor and the lawyer. Everyone has, a sm- many people have small lies to make to cover or protect themselves. Yeah people it's it's really complicated and there are there are like some like micro crimes not so micro but we can say micro crimes that are really difficult to explain outside argentina for example the vehicle that was used to to carry the bomb Mm -hmm. and to crash uh, towards the building and to make the building explode that vehicle was stolen uh, and it was something that here we call a twin vehicle because yeah. that was very <laughs> was, hard. i had to read that section a few times to understand yeah it, it was difficult for, yeah for which, me it was difficult too yeah, which is just to explain to the people listening, it's a, a stolen, well, a vehicle that is acquired. You know, it sounds like in this case, a car that was maybe burnt through arson or who knows, or, or stolen and, and parts of two cars put together to create yeah. a functioning car, but all done in a very under the table way with only the they, paperwork for one legitimate car. It's, yeah. And they buy the legal papers of one vehicle and they put those papers to the stolen vehicle so Mm. it's all it's all really complicated and this case is full of that kind of micro crimes yeah yeah and a lot of trickery it felt to me you know people doing their own kind of almost like a a card game where you're getting um conned Yeah. yeah yeah absolutely yeah absolutely um, one thing that I was really um, intrigued by, uh, as I was reading the story, I felt um, a sense of haunting. Uh, it was I was also reading it, you know, last night, late at night. For again, I wanted to read it uh, um, from beginning to end before talking to you, and um, today, and I felt a bit creeped out, like it's eerie. There are. You know, there is the death of Alberto Nisman, which is also shrouded in mystery. Uh, And there are lots of people in the story who disappear, who refuse to speak, who either seem to haunt the story or seem to be haunted themselves. And there is often um, the threat of violence. And I wondered if you felt when you were working on it any danger or a sense of people saying to you, you know, there are people who wanted to talk yeah. to you, but also people who want to conceal things. Did you ever feel like you were in dangerous territory? Well, you know, I was, no, the, the answer is no. And I was surprised about that because I don't like to, to, to find travel or to find uh, some the possibility of violence. Uh, after uh, so many, like, like 20 years of working in journalism, uh, I have learned how to avoid by, uh, travel violence or bad warnings because I suffered those kind of things a long time ago. So I was uh, ready to to find some danger and to say, to say to me, okay, this is it. In this way, I will now go on other, another way. Yeah, that's my way, the line I won't cross. Yeah. Hmm. But as I told you, everyone was so so open to talk with me, and and there was one of the suspects that is called. Um, I can remember now, but he he was a chief of police and he was suspect as being part of the selling and buying of the mm-hmm. vehicle. He was maybe the last one who in a line and then maybe he sold the vehicle to the terrorists. But anyway, he was split not guilty. 
but he uh, also was suspected of being very cor corrupt, corrupted, very corrupt. So maybe he was like a bad policeman, you know, mm. that kind of policeman you don't want to talk to. Mm. Uh, but he, I don't know, I, I say, in every case I say maybe because I, wa I wasn't able to talk to him. And in any case, he was pled not guilty, but he had like a very bad image. Mm. And he told me, maybe we can talk later. And then he never, answer me again mm. so maybe that was the guy who was who was going to give me travel mm. but that was no travel really mm. so i think time has done its work mm. like i think if you enter the case to do an uh, you know a deep investigation maybe in 2004 after 10 years maybe that was more dangerous but today it doesn't seem yeah um, so dangerous I, I was going to say any dangerous but it doesn't seem so dangerous yeah and and some of the principal people who are implicated in it you know up to the highest levels of the Iranian government have died so there, there's also the fact that some people yeah. are no longer well, alive I think that can be like the dangerous part like to try to talk with that people from Iran who have, I have here my notes, uh, who are maybe the masterminds uh, and people really powerful in Iran. There are still today six Interpol red notices, which is like the... the Like the, the, the card at, like to arrest people if they yeah, cross the border and yeah. Yeah. And I think that if you try to to go into their net or their space, that might be more Dangerous. delicate. Yeah. 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 But you need to travel. I mean, I I wasn't able to do it in Argentina because they are not in Argentina, like from 1994. Mm. So you need to go to Iran or yeah, probably to Iran. Yeah. Um, uh, there are, you've mentioned some of the people in the story, you know, the characters. I think of them as characters, even though they're real people, because they have a, you know, they play characters in the story that you're telling. And there are yeah. many compelling ones. I mean, there's Nisman, there's been so much written about him and documentaries. Um, yeah. There is the woman, Isabel, who's, a real name apparently is Nasrin Mohtari, and she is this mysterious character who seems to be um, a, a sex worker in Argentina who is ostensibly on the run from Iran, but then it is also suggested that she is an agent of the Iranian government and a mercenary who is involved in orchestrating terror attacks. Um, and there is also, for, for people who are listening who don't know, there was a prior terror attack on the Israeli embassy in Argentina mm. in 1992 that killed many people, which prior to the Amir bombing was the biggest terror attack, I think, in Argentina's yeah, history. Um, yeah. So she is implicated in that. And then there is Carlos Tesheldin. Is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah, we say Tesheldin because Tesheldin? Yeah. We, we say in Argentina. Yeah. In in the rest of the Spanish language world, they would say te yeldin. Te yeldin, but, yes. Yeah. Anyway. That's the Argentinian pronunciation. Yeah. And then he is a he is like a crook and a businessman, but a mastermind who um who, as you mentioned, he he does sell the secondhand van that we know is used um in the bombing. What is unclear is if he uh knows what it's being sold for and what it's being used for and his level of involvement he always says you know I didn't know I just sold the car but there's evidence yeah. that's otherwise so he was tried and acquitted twice I think twice and once more by a superior um, court Supreme. and is that yeah. in process now or has he been acquitted from that he, as well no he's in process Mm -hmm. He has been already, he was uh, 
accused in three trials and in two trials he was pled not guilty uh, but he went he did go to jail for 10 years but then he was acquitted and they said yeah. not guilty and and i think a very interesting detail is that in jail he studied law and became a lawyer and when he yeah. emerged from jail became a criminal lawyer who now works in criminal law cases and advertises himself as having <laughs> been acquitted twice for the yeah for the crime because he himself was accused he, of he's proud of having been acquitted twice yeah uh, he's quite a character as, he's as quite a character i i i felt that the story took on he added color he's, when he came into the story you know yeah i was, I was just wondering the main suspect the main suspect so yeah. when i was going to to do my interview with him when i was in in the car i was a little nervous you know mm. he had really bad fame mm. from 30 years ago to still today but i have to say he's quite like um, open and mm. i felt no danger talking to him did you have I mean there's just a huge cast of characters in this story and you almost need a map to understand them like a family tree yeah. with lines connecting people but did you have um I guess a favorite person to write about or interview I mean a favorite is is a complex term because a lot of these people it's yeah. certainly strong evidence that they have been involved in a terrible crime or if not directly they are corrupt and they are involved in covering it up so there is it's complex to be I guess entertained by them but they are compelling and I, I just was wondering if there was a particular element of this story that yeah. you found most interesting and that you kind of enjoyed the well, most as a, as a researcher. There, there are many but I will tell you three. Mm -hmm. You have uh, to told us about two, which are mm. the Sheldin, the main suspect, and Isabella, mm. who who is a, a woman that had it, it time in 1997. I didn't remember her story. So there are a lot of sub stories, you know, second level stories, really compelling, like this one. Uh, and and it was a big surprise to discover this character, this woman. Mm. I tried to find her today, and she seems to be a, a, a neuropsychiatric patient in a in a public hospital. So she's she's maybe like. Um, like in some deep psychiatric situation mm -hmm. and I wasn't able to find her and my third char character or who is a real person like this all people is Judge Galeano who was mm -hmm. the first judge investigator of the case and who was a man super powerful like from 15 years in the case. He was really young when he started with the case. He was 34 years old. Uh, and so some people, so he was removed finally. Yeah. And now he, is a, he was judged himself in a trial. He was found guilty, but he he went to he like he sent his i don't know how to say but to a superior tribunal oh yes yes uh, yeah like an appeal kind of an appeal yeah higher court. yeah so he's free today waiting for the resolution of the appeal uh, he works as a private lawyer so he's no more a judge and he also found yoga and he's a yoga instructor which yeah. is that's incredible imagine he was like Elliot Ness yes he was he was 
chasing uh, Iranian terrorists, he was chasing Tejeldin, mm -hmm. he was chasing corrupt uh, policemen, mm -hmm. but he was removed because uh, he was accused of moving some money in between these people. Yeah. So my personal impression is that he might not be a, a mafia judge, but I cannot assure that. Yeah. So he also for me he's a, a really he's 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 a man of shadows and lights. You mm. know he's he's a complex a yeah. complex person. Yeah. And. La, the last time that he had uh, talked with the media was in 2015. So it was also really interesting talking to talk with him. Mm. Yeah, very. He was he was a very. I like that that part about him having his um sort of second career as a yoga. <laughs> That's incredible. Achieving enlightenment. That also felt like something out of a a movie almost you know like if you're yeah. watching a almost like a like a bit of a coen brothers film where you yeah meet, I, I meet could, someone who could be corrupt and sketchy but then they they've become an enlightenment <laughs> yoga person it's yeah it feels a I lot of it feels like that because yeah. i was in his in his office his private office his studio as we say here mm -hmm. I think study is not the English word, but like his office, yeah. you know? Yeah. And there, there were the law books. There were, um, there were two saxos, but mm -hmm. I, uh, I did know he liked jazz. Mm -hmm. That was publicly known. And there was a Buddha piece, mm -hmm. a Buddha little statue. And there was a Safu, you know, the, the pillow where you sit to do meditation. Yeah. And I told him, Buddha, Safu, so you're into meditation. And he told me, well, I do yoga, <laughs> I do Kundalini. In fact, I am a yoga instructor. Yeah. And I was, I can't believe it. Yeah, it's a, it's a great detail. Yeah. He was really a tough man and a mm. power, a man of power. Mm. Mm. 20 years ago yeah um oh i have i think we've got time for a few more questions um so this is something else i wanted to ask you about uh coming back to borges who i mentioned earlier and who you like as a yeah. reader he has this famous quote about translation uh where he says the original is unfaithful to the translation and I love this quote because it highlights that the art of translation is of invention, not just interpretation. So I was wondering yeah. if you could tell me about your experience working with the translator, Robert Kroll, on this article, who you have worked with before. And do you think the English version of your article achieves something that the Spanish does not? Yeah, okay. So first of all, it was a pleasure to work with Rob or Robert Kroll. I have worked with him in my book, uh, The Murders of Moisesville. That was two years ago, one year and a half ago. So when editor Jonathan Perlman asked me about if I knew any translator, his name was the first name I, I thought. Second, there was it was also a pleasure to work with the editors of the of Jewish Quarterly, um, and now answering your question, I would say that the English tradition of journalism or the Anglo-Saxon tradition of journalism is much more factic than the Latin or the Spanish language tradition of journalism. We in Spanish, uh, 
we we let ourselves be more play more stylishly or stylish playful mm. um, so there were many parts of my piece that were like really stylish but not so factic mm. uh, and and it was so the editors asked me like go 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 to the to the evidence go to the facts so mm. take away your style and put go straight to the to the point uh, and that was quite um, that was like a lesson for me mm. you know because i thought i need to be more factic i am mm. a journalist and I, i mean i like to write Uh, I like to publish books, but I am a journalist and I write nonfiction. Mm. So I think the English version is uh, more accurate or more, uh, it, it has some details um, best uh, some details, some different details that make the piece more solid yeah Something like that i think yeah i it's it's funny because my experience as a reader you know i did think of borges and i thought of chandler and so as a reader i experienced it both as a piece of journalism that is rooted in the facts or trying to find the facts trying mm -hmm. to understand them and put them all together but it also felt to me like a very literary work and a bit novelistic a bit you know yeah what or almost watching a yeah novelistic is the best way i can describe it or episodic um yeah. and it felt like uh, i was having a good story told to me which which does make understanding this easier because it is so complicated and you can at times get lost in all the detail that i think if it was a very dry reported piece i would struggle to just stay in the story but but I yeah. it's funny that you say that it's the English made it um perhaps less slightly less stylistic and more fact-based but I felt the the influence also perhaps of um a kind of Latin yeah. American style of telling a story you can imagine my first draft it was yeah. super stylistic yeah um have you you know have, have you published the Spanish version is that not that yet Mm -hmm. Not yet, but Jonathan Perlman, the editor, asked me to make some noise publishing this in Spanish. So I am looking for the best place mm -hmm. to publish it in Spanish. I am in some negotiations with the newspaper here in Argentina. Mm. It's interesting uh, as well because that's an audience that's much more familiar with this story. So there there is yeah it's it's a different you probably have to tell it slightly differently for people who yeah, so know a lot of the story already but then there's a generation of young people that won't remember it and were not alive when it happened oh too. yeah i would say a young generation and for example my mother who is uh, an old generation she told me when she read it that it was uh super clear the the organization of of all the mess mm. so for young and for old people we we all need some some organization of of this case yeah and i was going to tell you that i am a big fan of you know emmanuel carrer mm -hmm. yes yes a french writer he's yeah he writes a lot about like uh, crime cases and he writes also about his his life his personal life and he's got a, a super conversational tone or mm. style uh, and i try to use that tone here in the piece like mm. something conversational something that can flows mm. Because if not, it, it it would be like a judiciary file. Yeah, it's like reading the court transcript. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, too hard. yeah. 
I, I think I maybe have time for one more question. I'm just mindful of the time, but this is this is good because it leads me into my I, something I was thinking about as well. You the the article is mostly concerned with what happened and then the corruption around the investigation. But we do learn a little bit about some of the victims and some of the people yeah. in the Jewish community now who are involved in AMIA and who are doing advocacy around this or uh, helping with the investigation, still demanding justice. And I wonder how you feel, you know, if this comes out in Spanish, which I hope it will, I think it will, it's a very good story. How do you feel about people in the community reading it now, especially given that you are part of that community yourself? You know, I think working in media, I know from a little bit of experience, as an insider, you have a lot of knowledge and it can sometimes make you the best person to tell a story, but it can mm -hmm. also be difficult because you do you know people personally who are affected by the story. So I guess I'm yeah. just wondering how you felt writing something about your own community and how you feel about the prospect of them reading it. Yeah, that's an interesting question because I didn't want to write so much about the victims in this in this piece. And that's it's because clear that. that that's not what it's about. That would be a different, yeah. uh, a different book. And that yeah. was that was because there was so much written already about the victims. Uh, but if I publish this in Spanish, or if I write something more like we can imagine a book or another a second part of the piece or whatever. Mm, I will need to go deeper into the community and I think I used to know a lot of people 10 years ago when I was with my book The Murders of Moisesville which is about the starting of the Jewish the history the, mm. of the Jewish community and the, the starting in the rural uh, colonies but after 10 years, um, I don't, I am like an outsider. So that's, I think I am in a, in a good position because I am an outsider and I can talk um, without prejudice with almost everyone, mm -hmm. I think. And at the same time, uh, they know who I am because of my book, of that first book, and now mm. I think this is this piece. I think, uh, although in English, is starting to circulate here. So I am like with, with one feet into community and with one feet outside community. Yeah. So it's that's a, the better the better position the best I can of both be. worlds. Yeah. 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 Mm, it's interesting. Oh, here's Debbie. I think at this point we do need to wrap up, but I cannot say um it emphatically enough how absolutely remarkable your investigation is. I think everybody, if you haven't read this article, you must acquire a copy of this Jewish quarterly, subscribe to the journal. And also sub subscribe to Melbourne Jewish Book Week because we bring you this remarkable um, global conversation in conjunction with Jewish Quarterly. And it's just been such a pleasure to meet you, Javier. And Alyssa, thank you so much for um, conducting the interview. And I think with that, we are on the hour. So we must say farewell, good night. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. My pleasure.